factors that are not that are not uh, served by the current discourse. So the summit is kind of viewed as a venue for really regional learning, exchange, and ongoing cooperation on that, with the idea of improving our forest management, especially ecologically based forest management practices. So we're really focusing on sustainable forest related innovation, kind of looking back, of course, what happened in the past to learn from that, thinking about the present and really planning for the future. Now in doing this, we, we really wanna take advantage of the long, uh, often underappreciated history of experimentation and innovation in the region and that. And partially by doing that, by bringing in voices into the discussion that have not participated in those discussions before, and you'll see some of that today on that. So we've had a kind of a history of uh, NIFS or Northwest Innovative Forest events, starting with a series of webinars in April of 2021. Then in September, 2022, we had a packed forest uh, meeting there where we showed up in person. And now we're moving ahead, of course, in, in today's and then later in next month activity. And I should mention here, I'm not doing that by myself. We have a, a team that has really been working on that. The core team from Alex, Colleen, Maura, Peter, Rowan, and Stephen, but also lots of other people that have been involved in some formal advisory board, but also in informal advising and contributions, including, of course, those people on the agenda today and on the agenda in, in the past events. And one of these people that has been involved from the beginning in the Northwest Innovative Center and made a great contribution and kind of pushed it to become what it is becoming fairly successful, at least in my evaluation, is Don Mortanic on that. So Don, uh, if you want to introduce yourself and then lead us in a blessing uh, uh, for the event. Uh, thanks, Klaus. Uh, my name is Don Mortanic. I'm a uh, Umatilla tri tribal member. Um, enrolled with um, all in my mother's Coeur d'Alene and my background um, uh, was graduated in forest engineering and I worked at Yakima Nation at home at Umatilla as a forest manager, Spokane as a forest manager where my mother grew up and worked 25 years with the Intertribal Timber Council. And um, I moved on kind of semi-retired and I'm now like a forestry consultant and uh, Northwest Tribal Agroforestry, but I'll go ahead and do um, an invocation. Um, it's in uh, Nez Perce language, which is my grandmother's language, although I'm enrolled with you, Matilda. Uh, Tatskalap, good afternoon. Uh, Katsyao Yao, uh, thank you for giving us this session on uh, from experimentation to innovation for the force of the Northwest uh, and appreciate thanks and appreciate to all the folks that have worked in preparing this, the speakers and for you all uh, attending. Uh, purpose of our tribal evocations of thoughts provide a transition point from our minds and hearts uh, to reflect and step from one place to another uh, and focus on our thoughts with our different communities and uh, provide uh, an emotional beat or story, you know, inspirations from the stories every one of the presenters and everyone here has their own story of how they're connected with the forest and, and like our tribal forest in, in the language themselves has, has an emotional beat and maybe one thought what makes this um, unique maybe today, today is, is actually it's a full moon, a blue moon. And um, that always reminds me of my mother's favorite song was when times were tough, she always had her favorite song, Shine on Harvest Moon. So I guess maybe as a transition point from our hectic lives, maybe you could think about what your mother's favorite song was or maybe story or something that got her provided the emotional beat for a transition and made us in it, whatever barriers there were in our own stories, there was a song or inspiration that got you through. So maybe think about your uh, 
mother's favorite song and inspiration for an emotional beat. Um, and so with that, listen to the stories our panelists and speakers have because each one of them has a, a great story and emotional beat that, that their organizations or tribes, communities were able to get through the barriers with their innovation. So uh, out everybody and enjoy the blue moon tonight. Katsyaya, thank you. Thank you, Don. What, what a great introduction to today's event. We, we want to talk about innovation, experimentation, and learning on that and, and think about how we all in our jobs and then maybe even in our spare time can participate in that. So for that, we we uh, have a formal presentation prepared by Paul Anderson, then followed up by a question and answer period for Paul, then a short panel discussion where we have panel uh, members starting with a brief introduction and then followed up by discussions uh, with questions from the audience with the panel members. So again, the idea is really to broaden the discussion and to in be inclusive and bring in people that uh, typically don't present at big research meetings like Paul and I are often doing, but really going beyond that in this film. So I'll introduce Paul Anderson here, a long-term fellow and friend. And, you know, he get started positive with me because he grew up in Minnesota and got a degree from the University of Minnesota, where I worked for 10 years, even though he graduated before I got there, but then got a degree from Purdue and then a PhD from California, University of California at Berkeley on that. He then uh, he had some postdoc and research experience, research associate experiences, among others at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and at the University of Minnesota Aspen and Lodge Genetics Cooperative when I got to first interact with Paul a little bit more on a personal basis. Later became a research plant physiologist in the North Central Station, a research forester at the PNW Station, then a research program manager leading the ecological process and function program. And I guess one of the main reasons we picked him today, he's been for a while acting and now, I guess, permanent director of the PNW, the Pacific Northwest Research Station of the U.S. Forest Service on that. And as that, he oversees 11 different laboratories, more than 300 employees, but what has really kind of qualified him, he's been thinking a lot about the experimental forest. He's supervising 12 active experimental forests that are part of the station on that. So if anybody has spent time thinking about experimentation, field-based experimentation and learning, Paul was the logical choice on that. So Paul, you wanna take it from here and give us, share with us your ideas. Thank you. Yeah, great. Well, well, thank you, Klaus, and, and thank you, Don, for the blessing. Uh, thanks for the invite to participate with this group. It's my first foray with this, this group. Um, so what I'm going to do today is, you know, basically coming from the perspective of the role of, of natural resources research and what its role really is in terms of providing knowledge and tools development that informs natural resources management and policy. And uh, underlying this is this notion that it's a development of both foundational as well as applied knowledge. And it's re that really frequently emerges from field-based research. And it's important to recognize that innovation occurs in multiple ways uh, in this endeavor. One is there's innovation in how we actually acquire knowledge and develop knowledge. Then there's innovation in how we take that knowledge and actually translate it in ways that allows it to be implemented in practices and management. So kind of distinguishing, you'll see a little bit of that thread, that distinction show up in my description today of what, what's been happening on experimental forests. But experimental forests are sort of a focus of my conversation today because, you know, they provide some unique elements to our ability to generate new knowledge and new innovations. And part of that arises from their designation as an experimental forest, but also what they do in terms of 
attracting participation and collaboration and community. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen and go through a bit of a, a PowerPoint presentation that provides some information and insights about uh, experimental force in the PNW and um, let me go, make sure I get that lined up correctly. I'm gonna go here. All right, are you seeing my slideshow appropriately, Klaus? No, you have your speaker notes on screen. Okay, let me just try that one more time and we'll get, oh, now it's showing up properly. There we go. Thanks for the insight there. Good to go? All right. Yeah, so my presentation today is gonna to kind of come from my perspective as Klaus described, both as a former researcher, but also as a current research administrator. And what I wanna do is describe some of the ways in which forest research has been successful in, de de in delivering innovation and foundational science and knowledge. We're gonna discuss some of the characteristics of some of the most successful endeavors and some of the challenges that have emerged to constrain other efforts. Um, central to this discussion though, is how we define issues of research importance, how we engage researchers, managers, policymakers, and the broader array of communities having interest or derived benefit from innovative forestry research. So uh, just as a brief outline, gonna talk a little bit about innovation, uh, describe uh, the experimental forests of the Pacific Northwest, talk a wee bit about the role of experimental forests, look at some examples of EFR innovations, and I apologize for the acronym, e uh, experimental forests and ranges, talk about them as place-based learning resources, and then focus in on a couple of the challenges and looking forward. So that term innovation showed up right away in Klaus's email asking me to come and speak and, and participate in this group. And so innovation, kind of delving into what is that? Well, a, a nice definition that resonated with me from the web, basically the practical implementation of ideas that result in the introduction of new goods or services or improvement in offering of goods or services. And if you look at that statement about innovation, it's really actually central to a research mission. You know, our enterprise as researchers is to uh, be able to bring forward information and ideas that improve uh, our ability of, as an agency or as natural resource managers or as policy makers to improve how we manage or provide for the conservation of natural resources and the ecosystem benefits that they offer. When I think about that um, definition of innovation though, as I mentioned earlier, I do kind of break it out into two kind of components. There's innovation in research in terms of how we do research to discover new th uh, knowledge and um, information. And then there's also the innovation involved in how do we translate what we're deriving in our knowledge discovery? How do we translate that into action and outcomes? So just briefly uh, talking a little bit about what are this body of experimental forests from which we're deriving information and knowledge and creating innovation. So for the Pacific Northwest Research Station, we have, as Klaus mentioned, uh, several uh, experimental forests distributed across Alaska, Washington, and Oregon. Uh, you can see we have up in the central Alaska area or interior Alaska. Uh, we have also down in the Southeast Alaska, along the coast in Washington and Oregon, a series along the Cascade Crest, and then also on the east side of the Crest. 
So when you look at that cadre of experimental forests, what it really represents in some ways is a, a representation of climatic and geophysical um, settings that can become actually quite useful in examining some questions related to things like climate, um, variation and underlying uh, physiographic context and whatnot. And so when I think about all these experimental forests and place them on uh, this climatic grid, there are some, uh, some interesting uh, transects or, or gradients that emerge. And for example, looking at going from South Umpqua to the H.J. Andrews to the Wind River, that's kind of running along our or a Cascade Range, we get a little divergence as we go to the Coast Range and look at Cascade Head and Olympic. If we wanna to go to Southeast Alaska, we can go all the way from our forest on the Olympic Peninsula up through the Maybe So and to Keen Latini. Interior Alaska sitting down in this dry, cold area. And then we have over on the east side of the Cascades, we have Pringle Falls, Starkey, and Entiat falling out. So basically, if we look at this cadre or this group of experimental forests, we have opportunities to look at those as potentially multiple data points or multiple uh, locations to help us elucidate responses or processes that are occurring across important uh, environmental gradients. I don't want to uh, you know, I've focused so far just on the Forest Service experimental forests, and um, but also want to acknowledge that there are also from our university colleagues several experimental forests and properties that also can feed into this uh, network of potential learning sites. Uh, got a little bit of an asterisk down here on the Elliot. I've included it on the OSU list, and I think that's a proposition that's still under development in terms of how that's going to shake out. But um, as the Elliott comes on board as an operating research forest, it's going to add quite a bit of value uh, to what we have in place now. So when we think about, again, the role of experimental forests, we think about research, and I breaking it out. There's observational research and there's experimentation that goes on in our experimental forests. They go beyond just entertaining the research community, however. There's also opportunities for learning and knowledge transfer to user groups and interested people. And so uh, they serve as a foundation for providing uh, teaching opportunities or demonstration opportunities looking at uh, allowing people to come in and see concepts in play. But they also serve as a, as a focus of building community. And this community becomes really important. Um, from a science perspective, uh, community evolves out of sort of collaborative research engagements or shared awareness, co-located research projects, things that build a sense of awareness and um, multidisciplinary uh, collaboration. There's a certain culture that emerges from an experimental forest where people working together, uh, bringing the science principles into play, uh, develop a certain degree of culture around how they operate and, and what that, that experience of the researcher and community is. And oftentimes there's a sense of identity that emerges. Um, I know a lot of our scientists who work at, um, do work at the H.J. Andrews or at the Starkey Experimental Forest where they're working in close collaboration with a lot of different people. Um, they've developed their own sense of identity around the Andrews and around Starkey and around some of these other locations where there's uh, ongoing work. And that sense of community actually uh, provides a sense of empowerment and uh, adds value to the endeavors 
when Klaus was speaking about innovations, you know, I've spoken to a bit about this notion of science discovery and understanding, and in a sense, innovations that help us understand the better or better understand how ecosystems work and operate. And a lot of our experimental forests do work that really is focused in on understanding ecosystems, the processes, and how they interact and play out under different influences. So if I were to think about some of the, the major innovations that have been occurring over the last decades uh, at some of our experimental forests, things that would stand out certainly include um, characterization of hydrology, um, and certainly the forest influences on water quality occurring that we're able to track through gauged watersheds. Uh, there was some early, early rare, relatively rudimentary experimentation looking at shade influences on water temperature. Um, more recent advances in technology and instrumentation allowing us to explore uh, hyperreic flow and, and nutrient exchange uh, in the hyperreic zones of, within streams and riparian areas. And then also uh, a lot of work has been emerging around aquatic food webs, both long-term trends and then short-term drivers or responses to disturbances. A lot of effort looking at understanding spatial variability in terms of uh, streams that aren't persistent or perennially flowing. When we look at some of the forest dynamics uh, questions and some of the concepts that are uh, underlying our, our, our movement or our development of ecological forestry principles, a lot of that has developed, a lot of those concepts emerged from some of the work on that has been conducted on our experimental forests. Some of the concepts around forest development, early successional, mature and old growth structures and functions, uh, the relationships between wild, wildlife and habitat relationships provided by that forest development. Certainly a lot of work on food webs and predator-prey relationships. Our understanding of forest carbon pools and dynamics. And then things like, you know, ecosystem fluxes, you know, our ability to actually understand the transfer of energy, water, nutrients uh, throughout the system. And then certainly climate influences and uh, you know some of the most important things that we've been able to discern from our network of experimental forests have arisen from uh, understanding how variability and climate dynamics have influence over landscapes and um, things like fire regimes and water regimes and uh, other critical ecological processes. A lot of that innovation has emerged from the technology that tends to show up in some of our experimental forests. So the investment in sensor networks, our ability to stream data for climate, water, and nutrient to animals, uh, such as the bioacoustic monitoring and whatnot, um, our ability to apply uh, tools like LIDAR for imaging and assessing both bare earth and vegetation, coming up with estimates of biomass. And then some of the genomics tools like eDNA for being able to resolve uh, what the biotic diversity is, both within streams within, as well as in terrestrial systems, and now being able to be sampled actually from air. So I think we, we, we see that one role that experimental forests have played is they've been a nexus for the deployment and development and application of some of these sophisticated um, technologies for acquiring data and understanding ecosystems. So that goes back to another role of uh, EFRs. And basically, when I look at that array of experimental forests that the Pacific Northwest Research Station houses or hosts, um, they really fall into three different categories. There are some of those experimental forests that are small um, or not necessarily, they don't have a lot of facilities and they tend not to be used too intensively. 
Then we've got a, a, a middle tier of experimental forest where we've got some facilities and, um, and ongoing work, re relatively regular ongoing work, but the degree of engagement and um, size of the research community is relatively small. And then we have our uh, top tier of experimental forests where we have a lot of engagement that extends well beyond uh, forest service scientists. It involves uh, national, international collaborations. And typically those, those forests that are active in that way, they also have benefited from being attractive places to work and for funding for various uh, national and international programs, such as the National Science Foundation's Long-Term Ecological Research or the NEON Ecological Observatory Network. And then even the Smithsonian sponsors uh, a set of uh, a network of large scale uh, forest plot, forest dynamic plots. And so what, what comes about when we have uh, this sense of community is it becomes reinforcing, mutually reinforcing with the infusion of resources and attracting larger scale efforts well beyond what uh, the Forest Service is providing for in terms of funding and resources. So when we think about some of the innovations that have emerged over the last, you know, couple of decades, um, I think, you know, we probably would have been focusing a lot on forest, forest ecosystems and understanding ecosystem process, ecosystem structure. But over the last 10 to 15 years, what we're also seeing is uh, a greater enhanced uh, recognition of the role of people and bringing people into that equation in our experimental forest context. And so one of the, one of the fine examples that emerged uh, over the last 15 to 20 years coming out of the Andrews was the Writers in Residence and Long-Term Ecological Reflections Program of Work. So helping build an awareness around how people interact with and what that relationship between the natural environment and people is and how they perceive that and value that. Um, up in our Bonanza Creek long-term ecological uh, program, LTER program, I'm doing quite a bit of work looking at climate influence on community resources. And as one example there is looking at climate dynamics and how altered permafrost uh, is changing the ability or the access of Alaskan communities to subsistence resources. So looking at some of the impacts of a changing climate and how that interacts with uh, communities and people's ability to access resources. And then another type of an engagement is some of the linking between the Cascade Head Biosphere Collaborative which is a group of partners really committed to linking science, art, local citizens, and traditional ecological knowledge. So it's an, ar an array of uh, interest groups that are working to look at um, sort of that cascade head and associated bios biosphere um, program. So again, different, different innovations are emerging and those innovations that are emerging now include people. Um, when we think about other innovations, um, you know, again, getting at that notion that it's not simply uh, developing new knowledge, but it's also how do we bring new knowledge and bring it into play for application. And some of our experimental forests or one of our experimental forests over on the east side, the Starkey Experimental Forest and Range is a good example of where, uh, a lot of that foundational work is being framed up directly in relationship to management questions and such as, you know, uh, looking at cattle grazing and understanding uh, best management practices for moving cattle across a range in order to sustain ecological integrity and, and long-term uh, productivity. 
Um, also looking at sort of that interaction between domesticated grazers and wild ungulates and how those two types of populations interact and impact resources across the landscape. And then again, looking at uh, what's the interaction between human uses, either recreation, things like hunting, hiking, uh, use of motorized vehicles. How does that impact and interact with different types of uh, wildlife, such as elk versus mule deer? And the impacts on subsequent impacts on use of resources in that range landscape. And then certainly uh, an area of, of major emphasis over the last couple of years has been looking at restoration practices for riparian meadows and streams. And we're just, the uh, H.J. Andrews has just received some substantial, major substantial funding in collaboration with local tribes, Bonneville Power Administration, and other entities to undertake a large scale um, stream restoration project that goes from the Andrews, but extends more broadly into the surrounding uh, watersheds as well. And then when I kind of think about and getting closer to where Klaus was talking at the top about sort of innovations and in silvicultural approaches and whatnot that have occurred, I think about some of the innovations that have emerged through experimental forest work um, and kind of in sort of a east side, west side context, we can think about some of the stand density management alternatives uh, and how they influence forest stand development, sort of in that amazing Douglas fir hemlock zone. And a lot of that was framed up or is either un both underlying, but also been framed up through uh, consideration of the Northwest Forest Plan and the conceptual basis for the Northwest Forest Plan. And then on the over on the east side, this notion of how do we how do we manage stand density and uh, manage understory fuels to enhance the resilience of these fire prone ponderosa pine forests. And so those are kind of two two separate questions, two different framings of forest stand management. Both of those have implications, however, for a broader array of ecological values and services. So under both of those headings, questions, we've got studies underway at our experimental forest that address the silvicultural questions, but in the, also with uh, the robustness of looking at implications of those silvicultural approaches in terms of impacts on wildlife, understory plant communities, uh, regeneration, cultural resources, and in some cases, riparian and aquatic habitat function. So kind of getting to a point here where, you know, what is it that we're looking for and, and gaining from EFRs? Well, one of the elements around an EFR that has proven a, a very valuable is that administrative designation as an experimental forest. That's actually provided some opportunity to undertake some treatments or experimental operations, looking at innovative approaches to management that would not likely have occurred had it not been in an experimental forest. And so that's one of the, the benefits that has emerged from that administrative designation. Um, and in that realm, uh, we have uh, one of the examples that kind of emerged from that was a study that was implemented in over on the Pringle Falls Experimental Forest and actually implemented in 2011, but leading up to it was um, in a sense, it was a, a study that has been instituted in order to look at different levels or different degrees of overstory removal, different density reductions in terms of overstory trees accompanied by understory fuels, mastication, and prescribed fire. And the removal of trees in order to achieve the um, desired or prescribed experimental densities of overstory 
involved removing some large trees, trees larger than the 21 inch uh, threshold for retention that exists across uh, most of the east side forests. And so uh, that administrative designation um, in a sense was a basis for an ultimate um, actually litigated resolution that allowed us to implement that study and look at those treatments and better understand the role of span density, even in these forests that have large tree component and uh, under typical management um, considerations, would not have been allowed to have thinned some of those large trees out of the stands. So in, a, in an effort to um, ability to have an ability to address a question of span density and resource uh, sufficiency, resource utilization, our designation as an experimental forest allowed us to look at a, a treatment and get a sense of understanding that otherwise we would not have been able to do. Another element in um, the role of experimental forests that I'd like to talk a little bit about is um, in some ways, experimental forests are, they're, they're place-based. And um, as place-based locations, as we look to implement innovative practices, um, oftentimes what we'll recognize is that an experimental forest may be a, a representative or a representative area for a type of ecosystem or a biome, but it doesn't necessarily fully represent uh, all the conditions or all the facets of a biome that exists across a broader geographic area. And so one of the things around uh, employing innovative research practices is what role can, um, how, do, how do we amplify or uh, mitigate the constraints that might exist when we focus on an experimental forest itself and applying a concept to a broader area of concern? So statisticians might call this a restricted scope of inference, uh, but in, in some respects it's how do we actually validate some of our concepts that might emerge from our fundamental knowledge and experiment on, on experimental forests and bring it into a landscape applicability and understand how well it applies in an operational context. And I've got a complicated diagram here, but basically one of the, uh, I think one of the innovations silviculturally over the last decade and a half or two decades has been the notion of, of green tree retention as an ecological forestry principle, feature of ecological forestry, green tree retention. So in other words, how do we uh, manage our forest development and growth by retaining trees, uh, continuous cover of trees. And then um, also some of those elements about variable density management. So it's not simply do we have green trees, but do we also manipulate uh, the patterning, the heterogeneity of their distribution within a space? And so there's a whole group of large scale experiments that have been implemented throughout the Pacific Northwest. There's about 11 of these things that are on the landscape now. And they've really, in a sense, have really informed this evolving concept of ecological forestry. And this diagram, what it reflects is, I'm gonna go through it kind of quick, but along this top axis, we're up here, this, these are controls, unharvested treatments. So they represent you know, full cover, uh, no, no uh, harvest entry. As you go down this direction towards the left, what we're doing is we're reducing the amount of residual basal area, the amount of basal area that's retained through a harvesting operation. Along this top line, it implies that there's sort of a uniform distribution of what's left behind. As we go down this axis, we introduce more variability in terms of the spatial patterning 
of how that material is left. And so we have skips, places in a stand where you may be treating a stand to reduce its base area, but you skip or you have patches that you don't cut within that stand. You also might have gaps where you open it up. And so looking at this type of a diagram, what I'm really trying to show here is that if we look at where this concept around green tree retention and how we're looking at uh, ecological silviculture, where it's emerged from, out of this body of work that's been done, only one study is sitting on an experimental forest, and that's the Uneven Age Management Project, which represents a pretty narrow array of conditions up in this corner. So that sits on the Andrews. All of these other implementations have been on other lands, uh, other administrative lands, either BLM lands, National Forest System lands, some Washington Department of Natural Resources lands, um, and so what I'm trying to illustrate here is an important point around how we take information and whatnot focused and developed on a experimental forest. How do we actually amplify and look at that? And so there's, there's a, uh, uh, a set, there's, there's additional ways to uh, bring other resources and other efforts into play in order to translate some of these important concepts that we're learning on experimental forests and bring them into play into resolving sort of a, a management application question. So another big challenge that's sitting here, um, and I'll try and go through this a little bit quicker now, some of the challenges that we're seeing both in our experimental forests as well as our large scale silviculture studies is being able to translate science into innovative practices. Some of the hurdles there are communicating science. There's how we communicate science going from a scientist who's probably producing manuscripts and peer reviewed papers and bringing that science into play with practitioners. So there's that being able to translate um, technical information and bringing it forward into more applied settings for digestion by managers and other stakeholders and user groups. Um, oftentimes it requires us translating concepts into tools or guidelines. So we're in order to bring those tools and guidelines into a format that's more readily accessible by users. And then further crossing that boundary from research to application, oftentimes some of our products are called uh, models and, and those models are often called tools, but oftentimes they're relatively complex models and they require a certain amount of expertise to employ. So how do we cross that barrier by integrating what the products and the outcomes of our scientists and bring it into play with user groups in a way that they can actually approach and use the models or the tools that we're developing. And so we need to be able to cross that boundary and that may involve having personnel or positions or expertise that sit in research and development but work directly engage with users. Sort of like our, uh, you know, it could be like extension services that uh, universities provide. Um, we have also boundary spanners and um, also we have within the Forest Service, our Western Wildland Environmental Threats Assessment Center, which provides some of those functionalities for delivering and integrating our science into use and into practice. The other challenge that's sitting out there is being able to sustain these long-term experiments or these long-term monitoring projects, be it on an experimental forest or be it elsewhere. The nice thing about experimental forests is the mandate for those forests is pretty consistent and pretty continuous. Um, we have an opportunity to make different kinds of decisions on experimental forests than are made in a management or a in a national forest systems lands or on a, a state forest lands or whatever. So we can have more consistency. Key thing that's one of the biggest challenges, though, however, is personnel and leadership turnover. So 
Uh, I, re I think of myself as an intergenerational scientist now. I've been around for a while and I've participated in early stages and in later stages in some of these uh, long-term experiments. But the biggest pitfall that uh, we encounter is when important or critical parties uh, transition out of positions and in bringing in new people to help um, carry forward the work. Uh, that's been a real challenge for us. Another thing that I'll point out down at the bottom is this concept that I think plays into this, this summit pretty well. And I would describe my experience in long-term management studies and long-term research projects as the most successful ones have been ones where we've got a really good stable relationship between the scientists and the managers. In other words, we're sitting in balance. We're on this, you know, maybe on a, you think of it as a teeter-totter and we've got a researcher on one side and you've got the, the uh, managers on another side. Great discourse about why we're doing the work, what we're learning from the work, how the work might be used. Then somebody leaves and all of a sudden the other person, whether it's the scientist leaves or the manager leaves, all of a sudden you're left with one person on a seesaw and it doesn't really work very well. But one of the elements that I think could add more stability to the long term is this notion around the user community as being a fundamental element to long term studies and research and learning. And I view it more as a three-legged stool then. We have the managers, we have the scientists, and we have the user community. And oftentimes where you may have turnover, relatively frequent turnover and manager engagement, you have the user community that can, can kind of keep, keep engaged, keep everybody engaged, kind of doing some of that lifeboating. Certainly scientists, the tendency, they tend to be around longer, but they're not around forever. And they also turn over. So again, building more of a three-legged stool with the user community can help us keep engaged. And I think you're gonna hear a little bit about some of this, uh, some of these principles in the panelists presentations today. Um, so I've run a little bit long, so I'm just going to uh, kind of wrap up with this notion of where we're headed. And I think where we're headed is a stronger investment in co-production in terms of research, uh, innovation, and implementation. You know, looking at how we produce usable or actionable science through collaboration between the scientists and those who use the science. And I use that term, those who use the science, more broadly than simply the managers. But it's engaging stakeholders, users, in a way that we engage from the outset in uh, defining and understanding what the issues are, but then translating those issues into researchable questions. We identify how we're going to uh, remain engaged throughout the research process. So how do we keep people informed, um, keep them involved? How do we incorporate different user perspectives and different knowledge systems in a meaningful way in developing and carrying out the research? But having this engagement throughout is building the utility into the process. So in other words, starting down that research pathway, but understanding what are the kinds of knowledge or kinds of information and tools that you're gonna to need to have coming out the other end to put into play and implement, out, uh, sort of generate outcomes from the work. And so building that utility means engaging with the users throughout so that the users can actually inform from the outset what the products might look like. And then, if you're effective in doing this, coming out of it with a sense of shared ownership, it's not simply R&D delivering product, it's actually the users and R&D managers sharing that ownership, working in a system of trust and uh, enhancing the applicability of the work that's generated. 
So with that, I'm going to stop and see if there's just time for a couple questions. And if not, we can uh, move forward with the panel discussion. Uh, we do have a question from Ben. Ben okay. said, on, on the topic of communication and event turnover, will there be a space for a fourth leg of the stool as a type of community relations team? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, when I, when I talk about that three-legged stool, it's just getting sort of that broader, that broader group of interests that are out there engaged in the process. And so, as I said, you know, a lot of our successful studies have been that manager researcher um, balancing act. However, if I look at that suite of 11 long-term studies that have been developed that way, out of that, out of those 11 studies, most of those are at risk right now of, of um, not necessarily continuing because the energy behind it isn't there. And I think part of that is there's not the input from the user groups that is potentially helping to inform and in a sense, build advocacy for why we should continue and, and sustain some of those longer term efforts. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Paul. There's a couple more questions here. Um, okay. Klaus is following up. Do experimental forests have a formal relationship to the local communities? e.g. through advisory boards? And are there any plans to increase such community relations efforts? Yeah, so that's a good question. So um, the I don't think we have, quote, formal advisory boards tied to the experimental forest. We don't have official documents that state that relationship or, or put that into uh, writing per se. But for example, one of the examples that I put out there was uh, again, like Cascade Head uh, working with that Biosphere Collaborative. In a sense, that's a group and that kind of dynamic will be helping to inform and influence how Cascade Head as an experimental forest operates in that broader Nesquin um, area. Uh, and so I think there's there is some of that, but I think one of one place where we're moving as a research station is around this issue or this notion of uh, co-production. Uh, we're transitioning to a mode of operation where we do an annual program of work, and we're actually um, pulling together now a new science committee that. Uh, comes in and helps us inform our annual program of work. So it does an assessment, some reviews, some sensing feedback, and can advise us on some of the things that we're gonna be undertaking. And certainly with respect to experimental forests, that science committee will have insight and access to be able to help inform um, how the station invests its opportunities around um, experimental forest. Thanks, Paul. Um, and then last question we have so far is from Peter. Peter asked, what are the processes for staying well-focused on the questions that society feels are most important, particularly as they change over time? Yeah, I think that's, you know, I think that's one of the, one of the, yeah, that's one of those challenges. You know, I think priorities kind of bounce around. They bounce around uh, quite a bit. Um, so how we maintain that long-term uh, investment, part of that is, is an internal management issue. What we've done as a station is we've kind of set up an operating framework and where we build our program around um, first of all, we build our program around 
two, two kinds or around four major priority areas, but within those priority areas, um, we invest some of our funds in what we're calling research initiatives. And those research initiatives are sort of high profile, uh, three to five year investments, things that kind of follow a lot of the priorities of the day in a sense. The other part of our portfolio explicitly focuses in on sustaining long-term engagement or foundational work. And I think having that balance between uh, being able to fund or allocate resources to being able to contribute and show relevance to a lot of these more dynamic priorities and yet sustain our investment and engagement around foundational lines of work and opportunities gives us that sense of having both a dynamic element as well as a stable element to the work that we do. And I think the challenge that you're speaking to is how do we bring that, um, the voice of various publics and interest groups into uh, framing up how we sustain that uh, public engagement, that interest engagement. And it could be both in the foundational line of work, it could also be in the um, initiative work. The initiative work is really framed around co-production explicitly. The foundational work is less so, but it doesn't preclude co-production from the foundational work. And I'm kind of using that co-production term to really reflect the notion of engaging and continuous engagement with people and communities and users of the work. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, we have a question from Lindsay. Uh, is there a way from for experimental forests to support research in ecological systems that aren't well represented within the footprint of existing experimental forests? Yeah, so I think, you know, I think there is. I mean, I think there are, in a sense, when you build that community and expertise that shows up around some of our existing experimental forests, I kind of think of it as serving as a hub and potentially being a source or source of energy for going out and doing satellite work in other areas that may have a relationship to the kinds of questions being addressed at the experimental forest, uh, but um, certainly getting a broader representation. I think when you look at some of those, um, some of those programs that are experimental or more active experimental forests are tied to, such as the NEON, or the um, long-term ecological uh, research program of NSF. Um, I think there are threads that run through those programs that really allow us to link, quote, sort of our focused efforts on some of our experimental forests to satellite opportunities where you might be looking at similar kinds of questions, but perhaps in areas that aren't explicitly within an experimental forest. So leveraging those larger scale programs, but and then leveraging the sense of community that exists at our uh, well well established experimental forest would be approach. Awesome. Well, um, maybe given the time, we should move on to the next portion of the webinar, and I'm sure we'll get to some more of these interesting topics in a, in just a bit. Okay, thank you. All right, so I think in our in our our next stage of this uh, summit today, we're going to go ahead and um, have our panelists um, talk about basically our panelists talking about experimental forests or forests where they provide um, opportunities. Uh, they provide management and opportunities and how uh, their experimental force or how their forests may play into some of these questions around innovation and uh, of, of forestry practices, uh, conservation principles, and bringing innovation forward. So we have four panelists today, and uh, we have 
uh, Teddy Minkova from the Olympic Experimental State Forest, Brandy Saffel from Tualatin Soil and Water Conservation District, Mike Wilson from the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Rab Ronde, and Lindsay Cornelius from the Columbia Land Trust. And I'm going to ask each one of those in that order if they would just kind of go through and give a three to five minute uh, statement of who you are and, and what, you, what your forest is about. And so, Teddy, do you want to please start us off? Certainly. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Teddy Minkova, and I work uh, with Washington Department of Natural Resources. <clears throat> My role is managing um, the research and monitoring program in the Olympic Experimental State Forest. And um, Olympic Experimental State Forest is located um, on uh, Western Olympic Peninsula. It's 270,000 acres of uh, forest, and it is managed by the Department of Natural Resources. And so you saw it on the maps that Paul was presenting earlier. It's not on federal lands and it's not managed by Forest Service, uh, but it is associated with the Forest Service Experimental Forest through the network of experimental forest and ranges. So it is um, a, co a forest in a coastal ecoregion with um, the typical associations with Sitka spruce um, um, in the lower valleys and coastal areas, western hemlock as a zero species in majority of the forest, and silver fir um, dominating higher up um, uh, on elevation. This forest is um, um, surrounded by Olympic National Park, Olympic National Forest, a uh, number of tribal lands, and private land ownership, both industrial and small landowners. The, it is an actively managed forest. Um, so about 15% um, still remains and as old growth. Um, the rest is actively managed. Uh, Department of Natural Resources um, has a um, sustainable harvest plan and about 1% of the uh, forest land base is harvested every year. Um, <clears throat> majority of the land base currently the forest is um, about 50 years old um, as a result of um, very extensive and intensive harvest that happened in the 70s, late 70s to uh, late 60s to early 80s in this area. So um, it is a multiple use forest. Uh, in addition to the timber harvest, uh, there is a habitat conservation plan that it is uh, managed under and um, oh, which is focused on spotted owl, marbled murrelets and a lot of focus on um, protecting salmon, so riparian conservation strategies. So um, the uh, experimental forest on this area was designated in early 90s. And uh, the mission of the Olympic Experimental State Forest, or OESF for short, is to learn how to integrate revenue production, primarily from timber harvest, and habitat conservation. Um, uh, on the landscape and deliver this knowledge to um, DNR managers for continuous improvement of forest management practices. So there's the first part is the learning objective and the second part is the adaptive management objective. So there's a very strong um, um, emphasis and actually a legal commitment in our habitat conservation plan of, of this knowledge transfer to land managers. Um, and so during the panel discussion later, I can address a little more of that. Uh, the program that I lead um, is engaged in both um, managing some of our already adopted um, um, practices um, that are in line with our conservation objectives, but also experimenting with new innovative approaches to forest management. The focus really is on testing new silviculture tools that can help with this integration of habitat conservation and um, revenue production. So integration is really the theme that goes through, um, through this forest um, since it's established in, in early 90s. Um, so um, as, as um, um, another part of the introduction, I would like to say that Although uh, most of our uh, projects are funded um, and supported by DNR, Washington DNR, 
really the pie of, of the experimentation and the learning um, and the adaptive management process in these in these forests grows through partnerships with universities and colleges um, who either bring their own funding or um, work um, um, collaboratively with us to obtain funding. Um, and um, these are colleges, universities, it can be um, federal or um, state um, organizations, research organizations like PNW Research Station or NOAA Fisheries. Um, and in terms of projects, um, I will, um, as I said, we have passive um, um, monitoring projects, which is more passive monitoring of existing practices and the active experimentation. And I would like to mention two unique elements of, um, of our activity that probably set us apart from some other experimental forest. One is that because the research and monitoring program and the management are so closely connected in the Olympic Experimental State Forest, it allows for, um, if not much easier, but I would say faster identif uh, identification of key management uncertainties to focus research on, and then a little faster, swifter transfer of knowledge to managers to consider um, for potential management adjustments. So that path is a little faster, um, and 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 that's a that's a real benefit here, being under one umbrella of one organization. Um, the other thing that I would like to say, and it's in line with the co-production that Paul talked earlier, is about um, bringing stakeholders in early in the process and having them participate in um, the process of identifying research questions, questions that are of key importance at the moment for society. Um, and we do this through an engagement process called learning-based collaboration that we're testing through one of our processes where we have managers, researchers, stakeholders, and tribes working together um, in a very informal way, not as a collaborative, of asking questions that are uh, of interest, incorporating these research questions into study plans, learning together um, throughout the process. Um, and, and we do specifically through a number of learning groups. Um, and I think with that, I'll stop my introduction. Great, thanks, Teddy. Uh, Brandy, can you please follow? Sure, um, I have some slides I'd like to share. So I'll pull those up. Can you see those, Paul? Just give me a thumbs up if you can see them. Great, thank you. Um, so um, I, my name is Brandi Safal. I work at Tualatin Soil and Water Conservation District. Uh, we're up in Northwest Oregon. You can see on the screen where we serve Washington County. Um, and we work with residents to implement sustainable solutions uh, to conserve and enhance natural resources. And um, I think that probably the most important thing to mention here is that uh, our clients are pretty much exclusively private land managers. So that means that we actually don't have any of our own land that we're managing. We are, anything we, any project we engage in is on private land and in cooperation with a private land manager. Um, so I manage the forest conservation program and our priority is um, enhancing and maintaining forest resilience in our county. And basically what I do is work with community members to assess any potential issues with forest health in the area. So that can be, you know, dead trees, weed issues, issues with reforestation, um, et cetera. And then uh, we try to come up with a plan together for how to address that issue on the property. And then we can often help implement that project in the plan um, with uh, some local funding and sometimes also funding sources as well. Um, and we also help with a little bit of education around um, interpreting Oregon's forest laws and preparing for wildfire. Um, so I just wanted to give a sense of, of where exactly it is I work in the county. So this is a depiction of the Tualatin River watershed, which is within Washington County, almost traces the county line exactly. And um, the hills that you see around um, our basin are um, the coast range to the west. We have the Tualatin Mountains to the north, and they turn into the West Hills, which separate us from Portland. And then we have the Shehalem Mountains to the south. 
Um, and most of the ownership at the very top of the watershed, so you know, up in these areas, is state managed or industrial forest managed, so Stimson or Weyerhaeuser. So a lot of the clients that I end up working with are a, a little bit lower down here in the foothills of these ranges. Um, and those are where we find the smaller ownerships of um, small woodland owners. So the, the main issue that I thought was worth maybe bringing up for this conversation that, that I'm dealing with most frequently in the foothills are increasing hot drought in summer and the impact that it's having on vegetation. Um, most frequently what I'm seeing is more stress dying and dead trees, uh, especially in the foothills, uh, mostly conifers like Douglas fir, grand fir, western red cedar, and western hemlock, uh, red alder and big leaf maple in some cases as well. Um, and then also higher seedling mortality and reforestation and afforestation projects. Um, so essentially the paradigm that, I, that we've been working with in forestry in this region of planting Douglas fir 10 by 10 or 12 by 12 with maybe a little valley pine or western red cedar in the wet spots is not cutting it anymore, especially on these sites. And it's not cutting it in the short and the long term. Um, so one thing that I spent a lot of time thinking about is on these more difficult sites where we're seeing mortality and having issues establishing trees is like, what is it that was here in the past? that could tell us a little bit about what's maybe better suited to these sites. Um, and then what can we expect about the future with, with a changing climate? And how can we reimagine what types of forests we're, we're establishing on these sites? Um, so in terms of like, in the spirit of innovation, one of the things that we're working on is um, a very informal forest establishment or planting study. Um, and most of this is being done on sites where we have a client who had to harvest a bunch of trees in a particular area because they were dying. And so they're interested in what can I plant back here that's going to do better than what died. Um, or it's a client who has a crop field or a pasture that they've been trying to a forest but have been struggling to, to do so. Um, so on these multiple sites we have across the county, We've been working on, um, for one, procuring seedlings from different seed zones and elevations and mixing those up into our normal planting stock. And we've used the seed lot selection tool from the Forest Service to help validate where it is that we're getting uh, the, the seed stock that we're interested in. Uh, we've also included more species in our planting plans. Uh, hardwoods, for sure. Oregon white oak is really important to us, so we're using more of that, which makes these mixed planting plants very interesting. Um, also valley pine and incense cedar, trying to mix those in to have some more conifer diversity than would normally be on these, these sites. And then most importantly, we're tagging trees that come from um, alternative seed sources, and then also establishing permanent plots to measure survival and then the health of these stands as they mature. Um, there's a lot more to say about how this is not a traditional experimental design. And there's a lot of things that I don't have control over in terms of like landowner preferences and what the state tells me I'm allowed to do and the tax assessor getting involved and all sorts of uh, things that make this difficult. But generally uh, we just try to take notes about everything that's different from site to site and be consistent about how we're collecting data. And we're hoping that this can be something useful that tells us more about what can be successful on these sites in the future. Um, so I think that's my five minutes and I'll cut it off there, but I'm sure there's things we can incorporate later in the conversation related to this. Great, thank you, Brandy. Mike, would you please introduce yourself? Yes, yes, good afternoon. Mike Wilson, um, I've worked with the, um, you know, the state forestry, the, the forest service and uh, a little bit of private industry work in my career. Uh, all in natural resources, but the uh, the majority and, and the last part, uh, I think the last 30 some years is working for the um, Confederated Tribes of Grand Ron. Um, and the last 15 of those years as the natural resources manager there. So um, that that was uh, great. I'm also also a, a tribal member there and uh, just recently retired. Um, a couple of years ago, so um, 
retired, semi-retired, and stayed involved in a few um, uh, projects that I'm really interested in, um, especially those around tribal resources and tribal sovereignty and and uses. So um, that's uh, appreciate being involved today and, and being able to provide some some input. I, am, um, I know on the agenda it has me listed as Grand Ron. Just to be clear, I'm not a, not an employee there anymore, and I'm not a representative. But um, happy to provide some context, maybe from my time there. And again, I, like I said, I'm still a tribal member there. But um, yeah, um, thirty plus years of working in there and um, tribal forestry. Uh, it, was, it was a blessing. I'd work with some great people. Um, great time there and uh, very committed committed folks um, and working in tribal forestry, tribal natural resources, tribal fish and wildlife. Um, fantastic times. And some of them are on, on, the, on the call today. Um, Grand Ron is one of those uh, confederations that unfortunately went through, they, they had the huge ceded lands where all the tribes were at brought to the reservation, many 30 plus bands and tribes, um, and then the confederation. So it went from the ceded lands to the reservation, which is about 69,000 acres, and then um, termination process, and then restoration. Restoration, the reservation was about 10,000 acres. I think with some acquisitions around 15 now. So so several hundred years of, uh, of uh, history there. And, and, 30 seconds or so. But my point being, we're continually dealing with scale, um, a, a small, small tract of land that was restored to the tribe, but a huge, huge area of ceded land, original reservation lands that are vitally important to two tribes, to the Grand Ronde tribes. And and I, I make this point for Grand Ronde, but I think it's a, a lot of tribes deal with the same thing where we operate especially the restored tribes, operate on a small scale, small staff, um, big area to cover, lots of concerns. You know, we still deal with a lot of the, um, you know, um, topics or um, concerns, um, you know, um, dealing with invasive species coming into the reservation, tribal lands, and how to, how to combat those um, different uses from the public. A lot of people trying to live on the lands, um, you know, climate change and climate change, especially around adaptation and um, new species been recommended, a new species in the adaptation process and concerns about how, what happens to the culturally significant species through that adaptation process. So a lot of discussion around that. Um, but a, a big one also is how to, on the scale is how to be heard, how to provide input um, you know, if Grand Ron is, you know, just west of Salem, um, but ceded lands down in the Rogue River, Shasta area and the Umquas, and so a vast, vast territory, but how to provide input on those important areas, how to, um, how to be heard, be seen, um, be recognized um, as a tribal nation and, and be there. Um, again, Small staff, small scale, big area to cover, um, but but um, strong desire to be involved and some great people. So, with that, I'll, I'll close there. Thank, Thank you. you, Mike. Uh, Lindsay. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen. So let me do that first. Are you all looking at a map? All right. Well, thanks for having me. I, my name is Lindsay Cornelius. I work for Columbia Land Trust, which is a nonprofit that's based in Vancouver, Washington. We do land conservation and management in the lower Columbia River region. And we have field offices in Astoria and White Salmon, and White Salmon is where I'm based. And I work in the East Cascades where fire suppression has dramatically altered the structure and species composition of fire adapted ecological systems. and where climate change is contributing to pretty significant changes in forest condition. So I'm gonna provide two examples of how we're addressing that. The first example is on the upper Klickitat River, just east of Glenwood, Washington and Klickitat County, where we purchase and are now managing 
few thousand acres of marginally productive industrial forest land from its current condition as regenerating plantation toward later successional fire adapted dry forest habitats. And we consider this to be a really important conservation corridor. Um, these are primarily young overstocked forests with haul distances that often outpace the value of receipts from the sale of forest products that are generated by restoration. So the economics of active management on these sites has been pretty challenging. But this is a high priority landscape in Washington DNR's forest health plan. So we also see opportunity for partnering with DNR's Forest Health Division, with our neighbors, the Yakima Nation, um, with nonprofit partners like Mount Adams Resource Stewards to advance cross-boundary management using mechanical thinning and prescribed fire. And uh, with leadership from Mars and Sustainable Northwest and with support from DNR and the Nature Conservancy, we recently formed a prescribed burn association and are planning our first burn as part of a TREX training exchange this October that's being hosted by Mars. So um, we also recently partnered with Yakima Nation on a successful America the Beautiful Challenge Grant program proposal that will help fund uh, not just restoration and conservation, but also the exploration of how we can partner in, in management decision-making with tribes. Um, another example I'll give is through our East Cascades Oak Partnership, this is a group of 25 tribal, federal, state, local agencies, nonprofits with about 260 members that are collaborating on the implementation of a strategic plan to improve outcomes for Oregon White Oak Systems in the East Cascades. And the partnership was recently awarded a $7 million focused investment partnership grant from OWEB, the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board, to implement strategic plan priorities in Oregon. And on this map, you can see the extent of Oregon White Oak Systems and our partnerships spatial priorities. You can see Mount Hood lower left and the Dells kind of in the middle of the map. Um, and so through the partnership, we're implementing a variety of strategies across a range of diverse sites in this transition zone between you know, the mixed conifer forests on the east slope of the Cascades and the Columbia Plateau. And uh, we've prioritized addressing the effects of fire suppression. So removal of encroaching conifers, reducing stand density, reducing elevated fuel loads, and addressing um, grazing and soil disturbances that invite invasive annual grasses and forbs into our oak systems. Uh, these are plants that alter ecological processes and reduce biodiversity in oak systems. Um, but I think what's most interesting about our partnership model is that we're approaching restoration holistically as a group. So we develop standardized monitoring and assessment tools. We developed messaging and outreach tools. We collaborate on funding proposals. We're developing technical support like plant material access and management guidance specifically. Um, the partnership is also focused on learning. So we regularly hear from researchers and other speakers at quarterly meetings. We host tours to review restoration outcomes. We develop research projects in collaboration with researchers to address key management uncertainties that have been prioritized by the partnership. Uh, we respectfully receive traditional ecological knowledge when it's offered. We present and discuss monitoring results during our meetings. We share information through a YouTube channel and on a listserv. Um, and we're also developing a website that will help deliver adaptive management guidance to partners and landowners. Um, I think that aligning the work of the partnership with not just strategic priorities for conservation and restoration, but around the uh, curiosities that we share about this landscape has really helped our partnership flourish. So that's kind of a quick overview of a couple different projects Columbia Land Trust has been advancing in this landscape. And while I could talk for days about Oaks and the partnership, uh, I know we have a lot of wonderful discussion ahead of us. So thanks for listening. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Mike, Brandy, and Teddy. At this point in time, we're going to go ahead and just start a uh, uh, discussion around uh, with our panel participants. Just want to invite folks in the audience who are interested in raising questions, please just drop those in the chat and we'll be monitoring the chat and we can introduce those questions as we go along. 
Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and, and one of the first questions I'm uh, interested, um, you mentioned this to some extent in each of your presentations, but um, maybe we can go around the horn. Uh, I'm just going to start with Brandy. So Brandy, um, what are the most significant questions that have been wrestled with in, in your group and in your forest context in the past, present, and future? So and how do those relate to your biggest successes or biggest failures? And what factors have really helped you determine whether you're in a success mode or a failure mode? Well, that's a great question. I, when I was thinking about this a little bit beforehand, what, what came to mind first is that with a lot of our work, um, I alluded to this in my slides a bit, that we have to balance a lot of competing interests and goals so we're often working with whoever's managing the land, what their goals are. And then often we're supervising a contractor who has limitations and a budget that they're working with. And then um, our goals, which are like, we're taking the science and trying to apply it in a creative way. And then sometimes, you know, there are laws that can get in the way of how we are trying to apply something. Um, for example, with the Oregon Forest Practices Act, um, as we're doing planting projects, there are rules around having to plant species that are merchantable. And that can be kind of debatable. Um, if we're trying to plant more oak, uh, a tax assessor or the state can say, well, that's not technically a super merchantable species. So that can get into the, in the way of actually being able to implement things is like working within what the landowner is comfortable with, what the contractor can do, and then what we're even really allowed to do. Um, so I think maybe in terms of what's been successful is that relationship building has been really important in our work and being very open and communicative with all of those decision makers and trying to figure out where there are ways where maybe we can shift the rules a bit to be able to accomplish what it is that we're trying to accomplish or, or compromise in some way. And we've been able to do that on many projects, but it definitely just means that the timelines extend a little bit. Um, and you don't always get exactly what you want when you're planning the project. There's usually some shifting and changing that has to happen. Thank you. So as I framed up the question, uh, Mike, Teddy, or Lindsay, would you like to, to follow on with similar response? I'll go. Um... You know, our oak partnership is working in an, uh, an ecological system or at least a region where there hasn't been a lot of focused research or um, published literature that helps guide our work. So we went through a process to prioritize our um, management questions around those key uncertainties. And that process was a collaborative one that involved a lot of different voices from, you know, tribal members to uh, federal land managers to nonprofit private landowners. Um, and one of the challenges we've had is just, uh, you know, building the relationships with academic researchers or university programs to, to, to bring that research to our region. So that's something that has been a particular challenge. A lot of our questions are specific to Oregon White Oak, of course, because that's our, our um, system emphasis. Uh, but there's a lot of complex variables and interactions that we want to evaluate. And so, um, you know, everything from fire, drought, climate change, how, how those things are interacting with our restoration treatments, um, even just describing the range of historical variability in this landscape has been a challenge, um, agreeing on a classification approach. So I think we have uh, a lot of challenges that we're, um, we've identified and have started to build resources to help address. Um, we're right now working with NRCS on updating ecological site descriptions so we can use those as a basis for classification. Um, but a lot of our questions kind of come back to um, how to characterize diversity, understand human impacts in our management, uh, how the ecological systems respond to management, and then uh, how to adapt our management going forward. Yeah, thank you. So, so Mike or Teddy, would you like to follow on with that? Yeah, I can, I can uh, briefly follow up. So um, in terms of the um, 
some significant projects um, that uh, are going on. As I said, we're focused on the integration of, of multiple um, uses uh, of the forest. And um, we have been implementing uh, a, a large, very ambitious experimental project called Type 3 Watershed Experiment, where uh, DNR and multiple research project uh, partners are testing um, multiple forest management tools um, innovative approaches to both both riparian management and upland um, uh, management. And so um, it covers 16 watersheds, 20,000 acres of land, of which 2,000 are actively managed under this research design. And so um, the goal is to expand our forest management tools, but uh, really what we see as a, as a integrative part of that is um, very, um, very um, a unique and very involved stakeholder engagement. And um, we have been doing this with um, goal of increasing the adaptive capacity of DNR and, and more participants um, that are interested in state lands management. And so this has been quite a successful um, stakeholder engagement practice through the, our learning-based collaboration. And um, on the topic of um, how do we know we're successful? So our partners not only have been supporting our project and 20,000 acres of, of um, experimental watersheds, we have been supporting implementing these through 13 timber sales covering 2,000 acres, of which 12 sold within more, um, less than a year um, in order to experimentally harvest and then experimentally grow um, trees in these areas but also eight learning groups have been emerging on topics of interest of our stakeholders um, that consist of researchers, managers, stakeholders, and tribes. And those have been functioning, um, producing their own learning plans, um, monitoring designs and so on. And so, um, and providing our support for implementing the study along the way. So I would say that these have been probably one of the most successful recent stories um, in the experimental forest. Great. So, so I have to admit to everybody, I went to a, a meeting that Teddy organized with stakeholder groups around the T3 experiment. And mm -hmm. sitting in that meeting for a day or so, I, that's where I formed or came away with my impression of the three-legged stool. So. Teddy, you were, that was an inspiration for me, so being there. Um, Mike, any comments that you'd like to make on that question that I posed? Sure, sure. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned before the Grand Ron lands um, and restoration process and the lands are um, on one side, they're uh, uh, um, butt up against the Forest Service, the Sayusla National Forest, and then on the other um, sides, um, industry, forest industry. So um, over the years, we've gotten a lot of, uh, you know, advice on different ways of, of best management practices, you know, especially back when the Northwest Forest Plan was coming and um, um, working a lot with the Forest Service folks and and suggestions on, on um, how they are managing and, and best practices but also pretty pretty strong input from the forest industry on what they, they thought was the best way to manage. And I, I'm not um, criticizing any of them. They, they have their goals and targets, but I think a lot of our work was um, building trust, um, building um, capacity and trust um, with, with our, with our um, uh, users with the tribal members, with the families, with our neighbors, um, you know, as as a manager there, um, and having, you know, I, I would have, you know, ants call me and say, hey, what are you, what are you doing up here? Why, 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 why are you doing that? And um, it's a it's a special dynamic with that, but but how we build trust um, in that process, and it would be very easy or easy -ish to adopt somebody else's um, practices, but just the tribal membership um, understanding and taking on that responsibility and understanding theirs, our, our duty 
as far as managing and how they how they adopt that and embrace it, and then also trust um, the managers to to make those decisions and take take their wishes, their goals, and put them into practice on the lands. And and, and like a lot of different foresters, I heard mentioned there's a uh, there's a wide variety of of what people want to see from those lands. So um, just building that capacity and and how you do that and how what the process is. Is, is um one of our bigger challenges and uh, uh, I, I know it continually is as as um players change great well thank you so i'm gonna there's a couple of questions showing up in the chat so what i'm going to do now is i'm just going to put the question out and then i'll let the panelists choose to respond um so just kind of queue up or whatever but uh so i'm not going to go around the horn completely so uh question sitting in the chat uh, does ongoing research in the PNW address the issue of environmental justice regarding the impacts of harvesting on local communities? I'm not sure I can speak so much to um, the impacts of harvesting from a commercial standpoint because we're managing for conservation outcomes. Uh, but I can certainly talk about um, the effects of our restoration projects on tribal values and how that might impact uh, tribal members. So we work a lot in our oak understories to control invasive annual grasses. One of the only tools that's pretty effective or, or nearly effective at, at um, controlling them are herbicides. And that's something that of course can um, damage or make inedible or uh, not useful, um, culturally important plants that are foods or medicines for tribal members. So we've been trying to come up with alternative approaches for restoring or um, at least enhancing understory plant communities that don't utilize chemicals. It's a challenge because a lot of those grasses are, are responsive to fire as well, which would be the other alternative tool in our landscape that we would consider. Um, so we're now looking at different seeding methods and different implanting methods and um, uh, seed drills and such to, to find alternative ways of, of accomplishing that goal. So that's just one example of how we're thinking about uh, environmental justice. Mm -hmm. I would add, um, because I'm probably more related to the um, topic of harvesting, I would like to say that in the study that I mentioned, our type three watershed experiment. Um, the, the philosophy of the study is that we are looking at environmental well being and um, community well being as uh, related goals. Uh, so each of the tested new um, forest management tools um, are being assessed for both environmental impacts and community impacts. And those include not just the economic impacts, but some, some social impacts as well. And um, so an example is, as we're developing, as we develop these uh, new forest management practices, um, we are currently invo involved with um, uh, projection tools that will tell us what will be the economic value of all these stands under these innovative regimes at the end of rotation. And so um, what will be the economic um, um, revenue from these treatments? Uh, because we know we're assuming some risks. And so those, um, um, those are included as study objectives and study steps. Um, additional element around environmental justice is that when we started developing the study plans, we engaged in very um, multiple informal ways of bringing the community interests into um, the developing of the study plan and in a formulating of research questions so that we focus on questions of importance to the community. So for example, there has been tribal interest in elk, um, in more cedar, red cedar on the landscape, um, um, questions around cedar browse. And so those entered our study plans as research questions from the onset, taking community input. And so some of our treatments, some of our um, um, innovative treatments are actually formulated as stakeholder in, in informed treatments. Mm 
I'll just add a real quick comment around PNW Research Station, our social sciences groups. Um, we've done quite a bit of work around what's called human ecology mapping. And so being able to uh, well, get a sense of what the values are that people are holding and then where different community types are different, how those values show up across landscapes and whatnot. And so human ecology mapping is a, is a tool that um, recently uh, Forest Service has stood up what they're calling the uh, planning services group and they've asked to incorporate this new human ecology mapping some of these types of protocols into the planning process, whatever. So I think we're going to see another element of this environmental justice community impacts showing up in a little bit more explicitly in our planning processes moving forward. Yeah, just yeah. Really, really quickly, if I could, um, uh, back to the, I think, to the question talking about um, you know, small communities and justice, but like uh, Lindsay was saying, that was really good points about um, tribal uses and gathering and really relevant, but just to talk a little bit about, I don't know if it's the other side, but um, I know having lived in Oregon all my life and, and Western Oregon coastal, you know, seeing the, the, the large uh, devastating impact to a lot of communities and um, a lot of tribal members that worked in the industry and um, and and the impact to uh, schools and roads and police departments uh, for the as the as these harvest levels would up and down. So um, yeah, I, actually, I'm not familiar with the studies or what's happening, but it's a it's a tough uh, topic and discussion. Um, kind of see, you know, like Lindsay had pointed out, that the gathering side and the importance of of those those plants that you're, 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 are important, but also, um, you know, the stresses on communities um, when that, that economy crashes. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. So there's additional questions here in the chat and I'm just gonna kind of bring some of those back forward. Um, I think each of you have spoken a little bit, um, but kind of getting back to that question of ability to um, determine the focus of your efforts and particularly with respect to uh, changing, how, how do you focus or how do you make uh, decisions around focusing your issues when the questions are constantly changing over time? Um, so, how do you how do you keep the general public involved with this dynamic uh, suite of issues that keep emerging and keep focus build the focus under those conditions? Keep jumping in. <laughs> um, through the Oak Partnership, we have quarterly partnership meetings that the public is invited to, but we also do tours out in the landscape and invite neighbors to those tours to have this real-time discussions about restoration outcomes and um, any emerging questions. I think it's harder when we start looking at like our monitoring tools because emerging questions might necessitate like adding a new protocol or collecting a new metric or changing the way that we're collecting existing um, data. And so to maintain continuity and comparability of data sets over time is kind of challenging when we keep updating or adding um, new inquiries. But I think um, as a partnership, we've done a pretty good job of uh, prioritizing our questions around our management uncertainties and staying focused on those. And that's just a, a long-term stewardship of the partnership where we're talking to each other really pretty regularly. Okay, so there's some some sort of directed. Oh, did did you want to speak, Mike? Um, yeah, if if you're if you're good there, um, I I was just going to share maybe just one um, example on some of that. Um, as far as like we talked about before, building trust in the community. Uh, um, we had a um, established a tribal nursery some time back and they're still doing great things with it. But early on when it was being established and um, 
um, native plants and plants for restoration. And um, there was some discussion, uh, some concern about some of these traditional plants, whether they should be um, raised or grown, established in a nursery, in a greenhouse, or whether they needed to go through the process, whether they needed to be out in their um, natural environment and be propagated in that form. And um, we met with folks that had co those concerns and uh, or, or the, the managers and the staff did. And um, they're valid. They, were, they were, heard them and we talked a lot about um, what they were concerned about as far as using these traditional plants and whether you could use um, properly a traditional plant that had gone through this process. So I don't want to get into, I can't get into all the details of the discussions we had, but, and how we bridged that. But uh, part of it, it was, um, it was uh, very real for, for, for those folks. And, and it was just discussions and again, building that trust and understanding where people were coming from as far as their traditional practices and, and what you can do and what you can't do and how to, how to, how to um, respect respect the, that input, respect the resource um, that you're dealing with and, and how to uh, how to show that in the process. Great, thank you. There's a ongoing conversation here. So maybe the question's already been answered, but Brandy, were you having a conversation with somebody about how to tag trees? <laughs> Someone just asked about how to track um, alternative yeah. seed sources. So that's in the okay. chat. Okay. Um, let me see previous. So would you like to comment at all, uh, any of you, around some of the more specific connections between sort of the research, the applied forestry practices and innovations? And do you see barriers to that research application connection as it plays out in, in your work? I can add something here. Um, that's OK. Um, I, I think I may be one of the folks on the panel that's like the most disconnected from, from research. Like a lot of our work is a lot more um, applied. Like what I learn, I have to usually go to conferences to pick up or just keep up with the literature. I'm, I'm not doing any um, rigorous active scientific research. Um, and I find often that when I am interacting with researchers that are coming to our area and interested in, in working with us, that there is sometimes a disconnect from what it is they're interested in and what the, the things that we're actually struggling with. And sometimes I wish there was a little bit more of a connection between us and, and those folks. And I was glad to hear what you were talking about, Paul, or, um, and, you, and you too, Teddy, about like having a stronger relationship between the managers and the researchers and like making that a very intentional and important part of the work that you do. Because I do think that that can be kind of a missing piece and actually getting that information to the people that are, you know, making the decisions and applying it on the landscape. Right, and uh, Brandy, I'll follow up on that, that I think um, one of the ways to do this connection better is to have a, a well-developed, what, what we call a DNR um, uh, adaptive management process, which starts with asking what are our key management uncertainties as land managers, or it can be a policymaker, right, or a, um, a conservation group. And then, um, and then bringing the relevant parties, uh, be it researchers or stakeholders early on when this is formulated and made a focus of research, keeping that connection through the development of the study plan, implementation of the study plan, collection of the information, all the way back to when information at the end, the findings are, um, you, you have the findings and the results from the research, how are they interpreted interpret it to the decision makers and then advising the decision makers about potential management adjustment there can be done. And so um, not only it's important so that the, um, the um, 
rigor of the of the study and the collection of the information is there and the credibility of the, the science is there. Um, not only that everything is relevant, but also through all this process, there's so much trust building and um, um, engagement that when it comes to management adjustments, you have now allies who are informed, engaged, um, have stake in the game, um, and, and can support you or find alternative ways to implement something that may have hurdles uh, being implemented. So um, having partners early on and throughout the process um, is, is key. It requires a lot of energy, a lot of sustained attention, a lot of attention to process, a lot of follow-up, but it really pays, I believe. And I wonder if Paul or Teddy, you seem like you might be in position to answer this question, but um, how do you engage researchers in an environment or around an ecological system that's maybe not commercially valuable? So there's not like a lot of research money being directed that, that way or where you don't have a threatened or endangered species that also directs money and attention to ecological systems. Are there any... We have all these partners who are excited about managing in, in these east side oak systems and um, just not a lot of uh, opportunity to engage researchers. Well, I'll speak to that a little bit because there's another question up in the chat around, uh, there's somebody somebody posed a question uh, uh, in the, the vein of, do I anticipate researchers actually being required to participate in co-production? And, you know, um, we try and incentivize, you know, in a sense, our, our initiatives process is trying to incentivize participation by, we're saying we're allocating a substantial portion of this, this, this station's discretionary budget towards some of these larger scale initiatives. And again, those initiatives are all predicated on, on co-production as a primary principle in the process. But in terms of, of um, sort of motivating people to participate in specific projects, a lot of that does come down to relationship building and us having the resources available to support their work or their being able to identify resources to help support the work that they would be doing. And so, you know, in a very blunt context, every Forest Service researcher, their salary is paid. So if they're working in our station, they don't have to earn their salary. Basically, they just have to be available, engaged, and interested. And then if there's operating funds that are needed, we have to work to figure out how to provide operating funds to do, do some of those things. Um, we've we have four initiatives that we've got identified and underway in the station. And we started doing this in 2019. The first two that we did was one on fire on the west side. So fire and more mesic forests on the west side. Another one that we did is, is uh, carbon and uh, uh, you know, it's really tied to carbon accounting or, or being able to understand influences of forest management disturbance on carbon uh, and implications around carbon and forest stands. Um, the third one is uh, sustainability of communities in Southeast Alaska. And then the one that's just started is one in water in the, water in the Northwest. And we're finding different levels of engagement and sustained engagement in each one of those different initiatives. And so I would, I would say we're still in sort of a learning stage. Um, one of the things that we're trying to overcome is a little bit of familiarity bias. And that familiarity bias is, you know, you're kind of used to working with certain partners and certain partners show up pretty regularly. But as we build a more social or a stronger social context for the work that we do, you know, we're, we're having to learn who are those other users and interested groups that, you know, we should be reaching out to or that we should be trying to engage. And, and to be honest, we're still learning that. And um, so building those relationships, we've got more to do. 
Um, one thing that I would say is um, one thing that may be helpful to smaller organizations is, for example, we've tried to uh, identify like the collaborative of collaboratives. In other words, not having to reach out to every collaborative group, but find those groups that serve as sort of a focal point or a representative for that sector and trying to reach out and make those kinds of contacts. And that may help us get access or bring what we're doing out more broadly to a broader network of people. But again, that human ecology mapping um, thing that I was speaking to is sort of understanding when do different groups in society sort of activate around an issue. And an example of that would be if we looked at the work that we had been doing for many years around how smoke impacts communities. Well, that look might have been relatively close and localized to areas that do, are doing prescribed fire or are experiencing directly uh, wildland fire. Then you get a big event like the Eagle Creek fire where all of a sudden smoke is now in Portland, or as I was in Washington, D.C. a few weeks ago and smoke hit D.C., boy, you can turn on all sorts of different interest groups and community groups just by that kind of exposure. And I think our ability, one of the challenges is understanding when do our natural resources issues uh, impact different groups and turn on, in a sense, different constituencies that, and we don't always know who they are. And we're learning about that more. So anyway, a long rambling saying, you know what? It takes a lot of work, I think, to actually identify and incorporate the range of perspectives that our natural resources issues touch. Thank you. So, how are we doing on timeline here, Rowan? I think we are about out of time. I know there were still some questions in the chat, a very robust discussion in the chat. Um, appreciate that people have been so engaged and interested in asking such good questions, but we do want to be respectful of folks' time. So wanted to thank you, Paul, and thank all of the speakers and panelists for gifting us our uh, their time and knowledge today. We really appreciate uh, you sharing your expertise and sharing your thoughts with us. Um, you know, we, we move forward as a forestry community by having these discussions, and you've left us with a really rich amount of um, information and, you know, just a lot of um, new ideas floating around that I'm sure folks will be considering and chewing on uh, in the weeks to come. Um, my name is Rowan Braybrook. I'm the program director at NNRG. And along with Klaus, I'm just going to be wrapping up briefly here. Um, we do have another event coming up this fall. We had hoped to have field tours in both Oregon and Washington. Unfortunately, our Oregon field tour at H.J. Andrews was canceled due to wildfire. Um, however, we're hoping to schedule that for another time, so stay tuned. And we do still have a field tour in Washington um, on October 6th. So the field tour is going to be focusing on assisted migration, both some current projects that are ongoing and some discussion around the ethics of assisted migration. And that's going to be taking place October 6th in Carnation, Washington at Oxbow Farm and Conservation Center and at Stossel Creek Adapted Reforestation Project. And Alex just put a link to register for those who are interested for the Washington Field Tour. We hope to see many of you there. Um, if there are any questions, feel free to reach out to any of our hosts and I will pass the microphone over to Klaus for any final words. Yeah, thank you, Rowan. And thanks everybody, especially Mike, Paul, Teddy, Brandy, and Lindsay for sharing their ideas and their experiences. You know, I noticed a lot of stimulations, a lot of ideas to pursue, you know, a diversity of approaches, each within its own context. And a lot of these ideas, of course, are, are ongoing. They seeds that need to be grown and cultured and grown on that. One theme that came up, though, was really the role of collaboration, communication, you know, co-production, sharing, trust building,
on that community building. And that's really what the Northwest Innovative Forestry Summit is about. So that, that I feel like we're really on the right suggestion. So in that spirit, please, you know, feel free to send us emails, contact us um, with your ideas, suggestions, how to move the discussion along, you know, what other topics are of interest, how to help us build a community where we can learn from each other. And, you know, we can be creative and it's okay to be bold. You know, as Jerry Franklin once told me, if you want to make changes, you can't be subtle on that. And I think without that attitude of his, we wouldn't be here where we are today. That attitude helped him to be successful in influencing uh, forestry in the Pacific Northwest and beyond by pushing innovation and changes. And we can learn from that, his experience as well. So I want to thank everybody involved in the session. Hope you many of you can join us on the field trip on that. The field trip in the H.T. Andrews is not um, canceled, it's just delayed. And I suspect that now with the fire, the discussions actually will be even more interesting. There's another dimension or two that is coming up. So keep innovating, look at all your activities in your job and maybe even in your spare time as a learning opportunity, even if it's not a formal experiment, at least I do a lot of my learnings going walk, walking with the dogs or with the mountain bike stopping and, and suddenly looking at, whoa, I'd never seen that before. And, and that was part of the innovation on that. You know, in some ways we don't have a choice. You know, the Red Queen analogy comes up. Things are changing so quickly. If we don't change with it, we're gonna be left behind quite quickly on that. So thanks again to everybody and, and stay in touch and we'll be moving this discussion forward. Have a good evening. Thank you all, have a good evening. <laughs>